Welkom bij weer een aflevering van Groen, de podcast van Femke Cornelissen. En Maarten Goed. Ja. En dit keer weer, weer een leuke gast. Ja, want we hebben echt wel een paar opnames gemaakt in Amerika toen we bij Microsoft op de campus waren. Ja, en we waren daar uh, uh, nou ja, voor in ieder geval een aantal verschillende evenementen. Dus ik was daar voor een leap event. En waar was jij voor? Ik was er voor Microsoft Blue Hat. En ja. dat, is, uh, ja, dat is een hele leuke security conference. Microsoft presenteert daar zelf ook, maar ook allerlei buitenstaanders. En zoals je Black Hat hebt en andere, ja, doet Microsoft blauw van origine het logo Blue Hat. En dat uh, was interessant, want een van de sprekers op Blue Hat, die hebben we dus ook in de podcast gekregen, Pete kijk, Bryan. Kijk, en wie is dat? Ja, wie is Pete Bryan? Ja, voor de buitenstaanders, Microsoft heeft een team dat heet het Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center. En daar is Piet een van de ja, program managers die best een groep researchers aanstuurt. Ja. Ja, en die doen onderzoek naar bedreigingen en naar landen die ja, activiteiten ondernemen die niet moeten. En uh, ja, heel interessant. En dat is eigenlijk ook precies wat we van hem gaan horen. Wat is dan precies het werk wat ze doen? Ja. En, uh, en hoe doen ze die research en hoe komt dat weer terug in de Microsoft producten? Heel leuk. Ik ben heel erg benieuwd. Laten we gaan luisteren. Ja. Well, Piet, thank you for being on the podcast today and taking the time. Um, I believe your official title at Microsoft is Principal Security Research Manager nowadays. Can you tell a bit about yourself and your role at Microsoft? Uh, yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, as you said, my title now is Principal Security Research Manager. The manager bit is relatively new, so only since November last year. Um, but that means I now lead a team of what six of us in total who do security research for the Microsoft Sentinel product. Um, so it's not really a change in terms of product area or anything I work in, but uh, for me, it's been a little less KQL and a little bit more PowerPoint presentation time <laughs> since taking on the manager role. Yeah, and leading and guiding the colleagues. Wonderful. Yeah. And we're here today in Microsoft Redmond. For those that are listening, that's the Microsoft campus uh, on the Pacific Northwest. And there's a whole building with uh, people like yourself working on the security side of uh, Microsoft. Um, but before we get into things about you and your team, I wanted to ask about Seattle because I believe originally uh, you're not from the US, uh, from the accent, I would say the UK. Um, is that correct? And how was it moving to the US? Like, can you tell us on the change coming over from the Atlantic? Yeah. So as my accent gives away, I am from the UK originally. Um, I moved out to Seattle 2019 now. So a few years ago. That was a, a big move, and I think it's probably one of those ones that I, if the situation happened now and I wanted to kind of take this role, I'd probably stay in the UK and do it remotely. Oh, yeah. But back in 2019, when we're still in the office, uh, it was kind of, uh, do you want to take this role? It would mean moving to Redmond or Seattle. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was a big move, but kind of one that I really wanted to take, mostly because the the opportunity of working with Mystic and people like John Lambert was one that you don't want to pass up. Um, and secondly, it was kind of the point of my life where uh, I didn't have too many ties in the UK. I didn't have a family yet or anything. So it felt like if I don't take the opportunity to kind of make a big move like this, I probably won't be able to do it in five, 10 years if it comes up again. Yeah. And how was the move? Because I could imagine if it was 2019, just shortly after the pandemic struck, everybody's working from home, you're in a new situation or a new area, like were, were you able to settle and, and, and dig in? Yeah, I was lucky in that I had, what, maybe seven or eight months in Seattle before we all went into full lockdown. So I still got to kind of meet people and my team in person and work with them. I got to make connections in the city. Um, so I really kind of got to enjoy Seattle before we, we all had to, to go sit in our, our homes for a few months. Um, but that said, it's still not an easy move. You know, the US to moving to the US from anywhere is hard from terms of logistics and immigration. And I think anyone who's gone through an immigration process that's not moving around the Schengen area, say, knows how complicated these things are. Yeah. Um, but again, I was just super lucky because... Microsoft is so good as an employer. They really help with this stuff. They help with relocation. They help with immigration lawyers. They make it as easy as possible. Nice. Um, so whilst not 
what I'd describe as a process that I'd want to do a lot. It certainly wasn't uh, wasn't too difficult. As bad as it uh, could be. Yeah. And uh, you had been with Michael before then? I was, yeah. So um, a couple of times, actually. So most recently in the UK, I was part of the field teams there. So I was what was at the time a technical solution professional for the cybersecurity products. Um, and then previously, a few years before that, I had worked as a security engineer for Skype. Um, quite shortly after that acquisition by Microsoft. So right. uh, this is kind of my third role now in Microsoft. But uh, e engineering and then technical enablement for sales teams and then now on the product engineering team, how is that, how is that different? How, 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 and how did it help you to already have, I would say, maybe some technical sales background? Yeah. It's obviously very different. Uh, the The way you deliver your impact is fundamentally different. You know, you're not you're not in front of customers every day when you're doing the product engineering anymore. But the goal is still the same. You're still there to help customers as much as possible, and you're still very focused on those customers. So, from that perspective, it's not too different. That said. It was a really useful kind of step in my career, going from engineering to a customer-facing sales support role and then back to engineering, because I feel I have a much better understanding of how the challenges our customers face when groups like the customer experience team come to us and say, we're hearing this from customers. I can put that in context much more easily. Um, and it helps me kind of keep that customer customer fixation that we, we need to have. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, actually, we have a program internally that tries to replicate basically the path I took. So um, they offer this opportunity for engineers in the engineering group to go do, I think, six months or a year in like a sales support role okay. and then come back to engineering just to kind of give them that experience. So yeah. it's something the company kind of sees as a, a benefit. A benefit, something that helps. Um, and you briefly already mentioned the acronym MYSTIC. Uh, to some people, it is mystic <laughs> how things operate here uh, in a positive and good way, I would say. But what what does the acronym stand for? And, and like, what does mystic do as a group? Yeah, so mystic is it's a bit of a clunky acronym, but it's Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center. And this was a group that still exists. It used to be um, a wider group that included the threat intelligence teams that do the nation state actor tracking but also engineering and research teams uh, like myself. We've recently had this reorganization where we've brought together all of the security researchers from the company. So uh, it's the likes of people from Mystic with the teams who worked on Defender plus some data science teams that were working in the security space. And we've come under this big umbrella. So Mystic still exists. Um, you'll still see it as kind of a, a brand that goes out on blogs. The threat intelligence team still call themselves Mystic and still do that threat intelligence task. Um, but we're we're part of kind of this bigger security research family now. Um, so I, I still kind of consider myself part of Mystic, even though technically I guess I'm not anymore. Well, and I think for outsiders, uh, it's just one group trying to achieve uh, exactly. or enable uh, better security. So that's good. Uh, but there's a lot of things going on because Mystic, like you said, from nation states, but also, uh, and I'm not sure if they're near your group and team of people, but uh, the folks like Ian, uh, Ian Helen and Roberto doing things like Jupiter. Uh, there's many mo other things going on that, uh, that that Mystic is doing. Like, like, what does your group specifically focus on? Uh, so my team is focused on kind of three things in our kind of mission statement. One is um, enabling SOC teams, so efficient and effective SOC teams. Uh, the second is enabling other security researchers through tooling and knowledge and data sharing. And then the third pillar is supporting the community through projects like what Ian and Roberto do with the, the open data sets and Mystic Pi and, and all of those. Um, and so whilst we focus primarily on Sentinel, for, for our product support, we kind of blend across those areas. So for example, people on my team and myself contribute to the, the notebook work and Mystic Pi work. Uh, we also contribute to the researcher platform work that is going on. And then we contribute to 
Sentinel, but we also support our colleagues working on the other security products like 365 Defender, the, the composite parts of that, but also uh, wider programs within the organization, like how can we leverage machine learning and AI for cybersecurity? So, you know, we're helping our data science colleagues with our like domain expertise, and they're helping us with their, their data science expertise. Right. And Mystic and uh, Mystic Pi uh, has been very visible to uh, to many of the Sentinel and security community users. Um, what are other things that we would see in the Sentinel product that that your team is involved in? Like, what are the things that you produce that that uh, that uh, that are visible in the product? Yeah, so we contribute to pretty much every feature. Where you'll see us most visibly is in the analytic templates, so those detection rules. Um, but we contribute also to uh, some of the workbooks that exist there, um, some of the guidance you see in the community portal, uh, things like the investigation graph and the UEBA insights, the, the kind of analytics that power those features is something um, our team contributes to, um, but also the various kind of feature elements. So um, investigations and hunting, they're all things that we work with the product group in. We provide input and feedback and suggest kind of, hey, maybe hey, maybe we should go and investigate this kind of feature. Um, and obviously, we're not the only voice in these conversations, but we're often the kind of first port of call when, when the product group's kind of looking to develop or expand the feature, um, simply because... Our team is just full of people who have years of expertise doing security operations, have used plenty of SIM platforms in their life. So we, we've kind of got that knowledge and experience to know what, what works and, and what's really needed. Well, and that experience is very welcome, I would say. Um, so when building those analytic rules and other items that show up in Sentinel, companies rely on it for building their use cases and the coverage. Recently, Forrester rated Microsoft Sentinel use cases actually as number one, uh, which was a, a great positive surprise, uh, if you ask me. But what do you think makes those use cases stand out? Why do you think uh, Microsoft well, climbed up the ladder so much? Uh, I guess two reasons, I think. One is that we, we're trying to change how both analysts like Forrester and Gartner, but also customers kind of view content within a platform like a sim. And I think often, historically, it's just been a case of counting how many items you had. Oh, they've got 10,000 items, that's better. That's obviously not the case. Um, and we're trying to, trying to position it as a value-centric proposition. So how many security use cases are we covering? How many like attack scenarios are we covering? How many threat actors are we covering? And not just covering it from a point of detection analytics, but the whole range of what you need to do in a SIM from configuring it to collecting data to detecting, investigating, and responding. So we're really focused on that, that kind of end-to-end -end value chain. And you kind of see that with some of the things that are happening with the product in terms of solution packages. So rather than individual items, you've got these groups of items. Um, so we're Like SAP different. coverage or... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And we're trying to now build them out less from a data source perspective and more from a threat perspective as well. Mm. So if you if you want to come from it from the other angle, you can you can also find that. So it's more a quality play uh, than a quantitative play, you could say. Exactly. Yeah, and we've all been there with uh, some of the other sims. It's, it's such that it uh, doesn't help to have much rules just to have noise. You need to have good rules. Uh, to target on. But that's actually a hard nut to crack um, because if your group produces some of these awesome rules and uh, the things we saw on the tech community blogs and recently in the defense report on the on the threats that get covered, like how do you prioritize? What do you invest in? Uh, what, what is the magic here? Because there's such uh, so many things you could or should cover. And uh, also, does it help to have the broadness of the Microsoft Azure and 365 platforms to understand what to target. You're right. It's very hard to know what to prioritize. And we're a, a relatively small team and we can't do everything. But I think the, the things we focus on are what's impactful for our customers in terms of what's the threat landscape looking like, what data do people actually have in Sentinel. You know, that plays a big part of what we do. There's no point creating content for data sources no one is using. Um, 
and also kind of what what are the gaps customers are saying they need help with. Um, again, a lot of customers have excellent SOC teams, don't need any support from us, but most people need some level of support. And maybe they're well-placed to have coverage for, say, endpoint-based threats based off uh, Windows event logs or Defender data, but have a bit less knowledge in spaces like Azure. So that's where we can add the value. So I think having that customer focus is really important for us. The other part is partnerships. So MVPs like yourself, obviously, you provide us with great feedback and insight that we can include. All of the other teams in Microsoft, the, like the threat intel teams, the data science teams, uh, the Dart team who go out and deal with incidents with customers, all of that kind of feeds in and gives us a view. Um, but also our third party partners. So you mentioned before about those use cases in Sentinel. Whilst our team creates a bunch of them, loads of them are also created by external parties. So the um, data source providers themselves contribute loads of content. Um, we have external groups like the, you know, the Falcon Force group who have their content, SOC Prime have their content. So all of that not only supports us, but also gives us insight into kind of where we can prioritize, where we can focus. Again, we don't want to duplicate something that someone in the community has already done. So we can we can prioritize into those areas where, you know, we have expertise, we have unique insight, um, and we can deliver real value. Well, and I guess that's something that uh, that is the value of community as well. Together, we can build more coverage than sure. anyone in uh, by themselves. And I think having um, the repository on GitHub underlying also helps. Or what's your view on uh, having that as a foundational sharing and collaboration platform? Oh, yeah, we're a huge fan of having it all open, not just from the value it gives. Like helping Sentinel customers is our number one focus. But the fact that we can put it out there so that anyone can take this and use it and translate into whatever query language they're using is great. Yeah. Um, it's also a great feedback mechanism. The questions we get, the issues people raise, the improvements people suggest, it's all fantastic and really gives us a much better insight into what's going on. Yeah. Because, yes, we have lots of telemetry and services we can look at, but it's still we still have a selection bias. We only see what we see. So um, being able to open up that whole repository for feedback gives us a much better data signal into kind of where to think about in future. Yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen the power of it where things get released and on day one the community steps in because everybody's dealing with pretty much the same thing uh, and everybody wants to contribute and if they take the time, they can. Uh, and then approving on some of the Jupyter notebooks or an analytic rules to get, to get something out the door that works for everybody. But, but it was an interesting remark you just said about telemetry because uh, there's a great episode on Darknet Diaries from Jack Resider with John Lambert talking uh, about MS-08067 and essentially how Windows Air reporting led to the discovery of the wormable RCE. Um, does like error reporting still play a role? Is it one of the buckets you, you can utilize uh, for gathering what to prioritize or threat intel in general? Uh, absolutely. It's probably less of the one of the less important ones for my team um, because we leave a lot of the endpoint focus work to the defender team who obviously specialize there. But it's still useful in instant investigation um, and that kind of whole response process. I think historically, it probably had more value, more impact because so much of the world was focused on on-premise Windows machines. Since we've moved to the cloud, yes, we still have loads of data, but we can't see what's happening in AWS or GCP. Um, we we have a, a slightly narrower window on, on the world, which I think is a good thing from market economics and competition point of view, but it does mean we have to think a bit differently. And um, one of the things we, we try and do is spend a lot of time understanding what the gaps are so that when we're creating content, we, we're not introducing that bias into into what we do and it's it's a challenging problem but it's one that i think as microsoft we're luckier than a lot of people in that we we do have at least that, that good baseline of telemetry yeah you you have a good pipeline of things to look at that helps uh, a couple of days ago some of your mystic colleagues tweeted about uh, kc7 uh, i'm not yes. sure if i'm pronouncing it right but 
to me, it seemed like a threat intel game on, on learning uh, how to do threat intel uh, and also KQL. Um, can you share a bit about what it is and what it's trying to achieve? I, I looked at the projects. It seems amazing. Yeah, it does, right? I've not been involved with it, but it looks like a fantastic project. Uh, and I was driven out of a need to improve education around cybersecurity and particularly the threat intelligence role. Um, yeah, it's quite a hard topic to teach, but there are great tools out there. And if what they've done with this project is really kind of bring all of that together into a really easy to set up and run lab so you can learn this. And it's all based off real situations. It is obviously kind of um, not real customer data or anything in there, but it's all real life scenarios from people who are threat intelligence analysts every yeah. single day. So it's a really, really cool way of learning, both for people who maybe are students, but also more seasoned professionals that kind of want to understand the threat intel space or just learn some more KQL. Yeah, and it seems very actionable. So that, uh, that helps to just go step by step and get your feet wet and uh, get into the threat intel yeah. play. Uh, but it's great, again, an example of what the team is producing and sharing that knowledge back into the world uh, and for people to uh, to improve on their own knowledge there. Um, so we already said we're here in Redmond in uh, in one of the buildings. Uh, tomorrow is actually the start of Microsoft Blue Hat. Yay! Uh, it's coming back, it seems. Uh, Israel did one last year already, but, uh, but now we're in the U.S. Um, will you be there? Are you excited in general about Blue Hat returning? Uh, yeah, very excited. Uh, it's the first one since 2019 in person in the US. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to see a bunch of people, make that kind of connection again, um, and just kind of learn from everyone's there. And um, yes, I'll be there. Um, I'm running the Open Source Village, which is going to be a community space for people to come and chat about open source projects, whether that's um, like releasing their own project, learning about things like Mystic Pi or KC7, or um, talking about how to use open source safely in like supply chains. So we've got a bunch of people from across Microsoft security, but also the GitHub team are going to be there and support. So yeah. I'm looking forward to kind of meeting everyone in that space as well. Yeah. And then uh, uh, once the US is wrapped up, we can actually move on to Israel because next month there'll be one in Israel as well. Uh, with a bit better weather because it was a bit <laughs> cold and rainy here, but it's typical Seattle February, I would say. But uh, great that uh, that Blue Hat is back and the agenda looks amazing, really. Um, staying on the subject of what lies ahead, uh, what do you see lying ahead for your team uh, and the things you are doing? What should we expect from Mystic in the coming months? It's a good question. Uh, it's always hard to answer that because we're so driven by threat actors um, we can make the best plans possible for the next six months but maybe tomorrow we'll have the next solar winds event and we'll spend the next three months working on that um, but i think what you're going to see and with this reorganization under microsoft security research is more kind of broad cross product deliverables things that aren't kind of siloed into say sentinel defender but cross across them that kind of join up the threat intelligence work with the product work a bit more closely um, and just kind of give a fuller, more end-to-end -end kind of picture to, to our customers. Um, and I think that's one of, the, one of the things we've been good at at Microsoft before in terms of that collaboration, but now we're all under one leadership. It means that like the planning is all lined up. It's not um, reliant on kind of teams making connections that they're already there. So uh, I, I think we're going to see some really cool things coming out of that. Nice. Well, very excited to see what you'll produce. And I think I saw that Roberto was tweeting there's also a Jupiterthon coming up uh, somewhere in uh, in spring. Um, so so happy to see where that's going. Yeah. Uh, we do always end the episode with uh, our envelopes. Mm -hmm. uh, for our listeners, we've got a stack of green envelopes here. Uh, they contain random questions. Uh, funny questions or uh, live questions or something you need to pronounce in Dutch, perhaps. So you can pick one. Uh, please read uh, the question out loud and then we're interested to see your response. So Pete took the one in the middle. Okay. 
Who in the community deserves a shout out and why? That's a very good question. Uh, there's a lot of people in the community that definitely deserve a shout out. Uh, the obvious ones for me are Roberto Rodriguez, who you've already mentioned, who does so much in the community. Absolutely. Um, the kind of volume of work he does is is phenomenal. Um, yeah, and yeah. probably before, otherwise we'll, we'll probably forget many, many, many there other are. great, but uh, there's there's so much community buzz around Microsoft security is something that, well, even my personal heart is attached to, but I think that's one of the things that's very energizing. It's a vibrant community with sure. lots of folks contributing, lifting each other up, uh, but also from Microsoft perspective, involvement. Uh, it's not just a side game. Uh, it's really something where you see each other on all sorts of projects and uh, and whatnot, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's so many different projects that people plug into that involve the community. And like we have people in the community who are kind of part of the customer community, but then through programs like the ones Roberto runs or Mystic Pi, we in we interact and work with people who aren't Microsoft customers at all, but still want to communicate and contribute to the security industry as a whole. And that's really amazing for me. Like yeah. The fact that we've managed to make that community so broad and so inclusive. And I think it's something that I really like about working in security is that we have that mindset. There's very few kind of competitive or territorial boundaries there. Cool. No, that is true. It, it, it extends beyond what your personal company or, or your personal goals are. So that's the power of community, I guess. Well, thank you, Pete, for being on the show. Uh, there was a great episode. And uh, again, congratulations on any, everything your team does. Uh, and thank you for having me and uh, see you another time. Well, yeah, thanks for having me on. And thank you for how much you give to the community as well. I think it's it's really amazing what the MVP community does for Microsoft and for, for the wider community. We'll take that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.